Okay, hello. Let's start for the next se session here. So to, now we are talking about, again, so actually following the, the previous talk, which is also about your developer experience for deploying your apps on Kubernetes. So today we try to, to convince you that you, it's able to deploy your apps on Kubernetes without the boilerplate. My name is Roland Hus. I'm from Red Hat, a software developer, a software engineer, and uh, with me is uh, so I, I'm Mark. I also work uh, for Red Hat as a software engineer, and I'm currently maintaining the Eclipse EAQ project and the Fabricate uh, Kubernetes uh, client. Yeah, so as application developers, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with uh, these diagrams. You start by coding your application, then you build it, you package it, and eventually you pass it on to an operations team that will be in charge of deploying this application and making it available for users, uh, probably in a dedicated server, which has a compatible OS for, for operating system for your application, and a suitable runtime environment. However, with the appearance of Kubernetes and the popularization of the DevOps culture, many of these responsibilities have uh, shifted to the left. So now you're not only responsible to, to provide this uh, package application, but you actually need to containerize the application and provide the Kubernetes uh, configuration files, those YAML files, to be able to deploy your application into Kubernetes. So to containerize your application, uh, the most common way is to use a, a Docker file. So here we have a really simple Docker file to be able to uh, containerize a, a Java application. It has a very specific syntax that we, you will need to learn and you will also need to understand and probably maintain in the future. And in addition, you have to have in your system a given set of tools. So in this case, maybe a Docker daemon and the Docker CLI to be able to interact with these files and containerize the, the application and finally push it to a container registry. Similarly, for Kubernetes, you will also need to uh, create and maintain uh, these YAML files. So I think that the most simple deployment that you can do requires at least these four files, so a deployment, service, config map, secret. But obviously, eventually, you will need more resources, maybe an ingress, a volume, autoscaling uh, capabilities, and so on. So each of these resources uh, have a very specific syntax that you, again, need to understand, need to master, and will need to maintain in the future. And also, just like for the Docker files, you will also need uh, specific tools in your uh, environment to be able to interact with these files and eventually deploy them to your cluster. So here in this example, you have this kubectl apply, and finally, uh, that will finally let you deploy the, the YAML files into the, into the cluster. So in theory, everything looks nice and so on. But uh, as your application grows uh, in complexity and also gets older, so the, do these files, right? They, they become longer and they become larger in quantity. You get to, to deal with more and more files, which get more and more complex. Yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> so as, a, as an application uh, developer, and I think we've been hearing about this all, all the morning. Right? I've been here uh, a while, and I've, everyone has been talking about this complexity. I think that what we want is to have certain uh, tools that will actually help us uh, deal with uh, all of this complexity. So uh, now Roland will uh, give us a good overview of the, of the available tools. Yeah, sure. So actually, we have seen also not, not only, of course, you know these kind of YAMLs. We have seen all in the first session by, by Marcos and Mauricio how, how, what kind of hell this is, really. And we are really wondering whether this couldn't be done better. So we no, all knew the old times as developers. So we are all developers here. So. Um, and uh, actually, Kubernetes is not made for us, right? It's just it's an abstraction which is for operations and not. And, and we have seen can be really very, very verbous. And what is needed, what people are really trying to do, is to add additional abstraction to the job of Kubernetes. And hopefully, these abstractions will help you to understand the complexity and to master the complexity of Kubernetes itself. And uh, yeah, let's. Have a quick look what's out there in the wild. And our approach now is I give a very brief overview of the things that we think that are helpful. There would be a list which is obviously not comprehensive. It's a subjective selection that we have picked. And they all deal about two concepts. So when you're a developer, you have actually two tasks, right? You uh, a developer for Kubernetes, to be honest. So you need to build container images somehow, so you need to create those. We have seen the Docker files. They can be also very complex. And then you need to get all the stuff onto Kubernetes. And for that, you, you are probably 
pop up your editor, create YAML files, and deploy this. So this is the usual way, and we will look whether this goes better. Daniel just talked a lot about the, the inner and outer loop, and this is a very important concept for all the developers in there, because actually I'm, as a developer, I really want to live in the inner loop, right? So I want to have quick feedback on this stuff. I, I do not want to uh, make a change, push it to Gibbs, and then uh, Git, sorry, push it to Git, and then uh, just to check out what my code has done. I want to stay local. Maybe this is uh, the day-to-day, -day, so there might be a brighter future with road, road de uh, de development. But as it is now, uh, we are all living in the inner loop. And let's look what th those tools have in the box for the inner loop. And the outer loop is actually, uh, I don't have to talk much more on that. So outer loop is exactly how you get all the stuff into production and do all the, the big test cycles so for end-to-end for -end testing and whatnot. Yeah, so what, what we thought about, actually, the, we have in the, uh, invented a fun matrix, which is called the YAML stealth level, which means how much of YAML you can really hide in the developer platform. And with YAML, we don't, do not mean the, the syntax or the format itself. We just mean all the comp uh, complexity that Kubernetes YAML is bringing with me. So it's a kind of a uh, code word, so to say. And uh, in the next slide, we see that there's kind of a correlation between uh, the YAML stealth level, so how much you uh, hide YAML. So on the left-hand side, you see that you have direct exposure of all the Kubernetes complexity. And then on the right-hand side, you see have some, some shielding uh, by the developer tools that you are using. And of course, there is a trade-off, right? So all these tools are very opinionated. They make opinions, they make decisions for you. And uh, then you lose, of course, some kind of flexibility, but it's easier to understand. Your learning curve is, uh, is lower. And uh, yeah, so, and then, uh, of course, now we have uh, here a list of, of various tools that all are dealing with, um, with help you. Actually, this is a kind, as I said, a very subjectively, we widely picked some. We probably also missed very important ones, so please uh, uh, bear with us. Actually, yeah, so let's go quickly over all of those. So the first one on the list is Helm. So probably, who of you do not know Helm? Let's say, ask me the question this way around. So, okay, everybody is kind of knows Helm. So maturity here means also popularity, so it's not really mean that it's super stable, but Helm is uh, everywhere, and it's not really a developer tool, right? It's, but actually, we as developers usually have to deal with Helm if we set up our dependencies, for example, and uh, and yeah, so, there, so it made it into the list. Of course, the, the YAML stealth level, the, the YSL, is very low because you are directly exposed to the YAML itself if you create a chart. But of course, if you consume it, you are probably uh, shielded from that. So it's a little bit uh, biased here. And the next one are more, already uh, longer on the, out there already. I just mentioned them. So they all have kind of the, a similar scope, like, so I'm, uh, like Arden, Octator, and, and Tilt. Um, but with slightly different focus. So for example, Gardenmore is focusing on, on, on modeling the dependencies among microservices and give you also a local developer experience, like whereas Octato more has a focus on developing within the cloud with uh, developing containers, and Tilde also has a very high focus on local developer experience in there. Uh, and then we, today in the morning we heard about Dagger, that you can also kind of consider Dagger as a development tool. But you might not really directly um, think about that, but, but we have seen that you can really improve your local development experience as well with Dagger, uh, and not only uh, creating your CI pipelines programmatically. Um, and then finally, then we have other um, dinosaur here, like Scaffold is also, also already also out there since uh, quite a long time. And um, gives you also the ab ability to, to directly build your, your container images without create, having Docker files, so they're leveraging build packs for that, and then push it out to the cloud. And finally, something which might be a little bit surprising on the list are Canadian functions. So um, Canadian functions is also a very opinionated way how you get your local code on top of Knative. So Knative is a serverless add-on on top of Kubernetes, and uh, you can le learn more about uh, Canadian functions in the Canadian maintainer session on Friday, too. But it's also kind of a, a new thing which, which you might be interested in. So this is an overview. We have the links there and the slides. So if you download the slides, you have an entry point in there. And I have to say that, that this list is really about cross-language tooling. So this is really about tools that you can, that usually come with an own CLI. So they kind of impose their development workflow onto your workflow. And uh, the, in the next list, list, we see a little bit more uh, tooling, which is a little bit deeper and which really integrates into your current uh, development 
uh, workflow, which you already have, which often is much, much easier. And uh, so, but uh, surprisingly, there's, the list is not very large. Actually, it's only around. Uh, so this is what we found. So please uh, come, come to me and tell me more if you know for for Node and Python. Though I don't, uh, we couldn't really find any any deep integration in the Python build system uh, for creating this kind of deployment stuff and uh, container images. But KO is really a brilliant tool. So if you haven't used it, and if you're a Golang developer, you probably, uh, but, but you have, for sure have heard about it. So KO is a tool which uh, creates container images out of your Go build files so without any Docker files. So it's also very opinionated how it creates the, the images, but uh, you can choose them. Then we have Chip, which is uh, coming in the Java world, and it comes as a Maven and Cradle plugin to create your also your container images without any Docker daemon, which is quite nice because it just packs it together. And then finally, we have JCube. So one qu question, who have heard about JCube already? Nobody? Uh, one? OK, that's great because uh, the rest of the talk will be about JCube. And this is our, as I said, our approach is a quick overview of everything. And now we dive deep into a single one. And I think and we think that JCube is a very nice thing how you can integrate into your current existing Maven and Gradle builds without learning any no new tooling. So this is a very uh, nice thing. OK, so JCube is a set of uh, tools and plugins that will actually uh, help you generate container images and generate and deploy uh, the cluster configuration manifests for your Java application. So it's a Java-specific uh, tool. We saw before that they were cross-language, and then this one specific for Java. Uh, JCube consists of uh, several components. So there is this JCube kit, which uh, contains all the logic for, uh, for JCube. And uh, that can be actually consumed as a standalone library. However, there are a set of tools, uh, a set of plugins, uh, in this case, the Kubernetes Maven and Gradle plugin, that actually expose all of the JCube functionality and that can be uh, consumed through, through Maven. Similarly, there is uh, the OpenShift Maven and Gradle plugin that is built on top of the Kubernetes Maven and Gradle plugins and offer specific functionality uh, for OpenShift. So yeah, I, I really like to think about uh, JCube as the Java way into Kubernetes because it, it's actually really easy to integrate into any kind of uh, Java project. So here we have two examples. Uh, if you have a Maven project, you simply add uh, JCube or the Kubernetes Maven plugin into your plugin section, and you're actually ready to go. And you can actually execute uh, most of uh, or leverage most of JCube's uh, features by running them as uh, uh, separate uh, Maven goals. So in this case, you can package your application as usual, but then you can actually build a container image, generate the cluster resources, and finally deploy them into, into your Kubernetes cluster. Similarly for, for Gradle, uh, there is the Kubernetes Gradle plugin that you can simply add to the build.gradle uh, file, and then you can actually leverage the JCube features as if they were Gradle tasks. So same as for uh, Maven, we have the equivalent uh, for, for Gradle. So um, one of the main advantages of uh, JCube is that you actually don't need to install any other uh, tool in your machine. If you have a Java development kit and Maven or Gradle, you add it to your project, and that's it. You don't need to have kubectl. You don't need a Docker daemon. You don't need a Docker CLI. You don't need anything. In addition, something really, really cool is that uh, JCube actually encapsulates uh, different build strategies. So just by changing a configuration flag, you can go from building your container image using Docker to use JIP, build packs, or even uh, S2I build strategy. As uh, Roland mentioned before, uh, there was this uh, JAML stealth uh, <laughs> levels of complexity. So one of the good things of JCube is that you can go from zero configuration. So basically, JCube provides support for multiple frameworks, uh, Spring Boot, uh, Micronaut, Quarkus, and even standalone Java applications. And it will uh, generate uh, suitable defaults for, um, for those frameworks. Obviously, if uh, maybe those, they, they aren't suitable for your applications or for your needs, so you can actually override these uh, opinionated defaults by providing XML configuration if you're using uh, Maven or build uh, DSL configuration if uh, you are using Gradle. You can even provide uh, what we call YAML fragments. So these are small pieces of, uh, of YAML. So if you have a deployment, maybe you can provide the annotations or the labels. And what will JCube do is uh, read these fragments and merge them with those that it generates for you. Um, yeah, and finally, uh, the good thing about JCube is that it's designed both for the inner and the outer loop. 
So for the inner loop, it provides uh, many, many features, such as uh, debugging your application in the, in the cluster, or even uh, live code your application with the remote dev uh, feature. So we saw before this remote call approach with this container. Jcube has this embedded inside, so you can actually uh, uh, live code your application while it's still interacting with uh, other services in your cluster. And it's also designed for the outer loop, so it provides uh, some tools that uh, can be uh, really useful uh, for your CI environment. So you can actually push your container images to a Docker registry, you can generate Helm charts, you can uh, push those charts to a Helm registry, and so on. Yeah, so this diagram basically, uh, and before we go into the demo, shows how Jcube works. So basically what Jcube does once you invoke uh, one of the, the goals or the tasks is it inspects your project, it analyzes it, and then it generates some uh, opinionated defaults. If you run the KHS build uh, goal, it will actually uh, use the, these defaults to generate a container image that should be suitable for your application. Then you can run the KHS push, which will push the container image to a Docker registry or a container image registry. And similarly, you can run the KHS resource goal to generate cluster manifests and KHS deploy to deploy them into your cluster. So, yeah, talk is cheap. Uh, I think it's better if we see this in action. So, here I have uh, a very simple Spring Boot uh, project. This is the simplest uh, project I could generate. It has just the definition of the Spring Boot parent and then a dependency to the Spring Boot starter web. And it has just a single class. So, it has the, this, uh, REST controller that it exposes a, an endpoint in the root path. So when you perform a GET request, you will get this uh, simple greeting. And if we want to uh, leverage Jcube, the only thing that we need to do, as we saw in the, in the previous slides, is add the, the plugin to our plugin section. And we should be actually ready to go. However, since I want to, um, to deploy, uh, to push my image to a Docker registry. I'm going to provide some, some overrides to the default. So we saw that Jcube provides this, uh, uh, this feature. So in order to push this to Docker Hub, I need to provide my username. Um, so it's important to note here that you usually you don't need any configuration if you don't want to have. So you get also the name created automatically. But if you want, you have also the ability to override this and to, to adjust this so as you like. And of course, this uh, configuration or customization goes very far so that you could even create, uh, add direct YAML files. Like that. Yeah, so now also in addition to the standard resources, I'm, I'm going to create a, um, make this bigger, uh, an ingress. So I'm going to deploy this into my Minikube cluster and I need my IP. and. With this, I will create a, a, an ingress uh, leveraging the NIP nip.io um, service. So I will set the base domain here. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> create external URLs. Yeah, I think that should be it. Yeah, with just these simple uh, configurations, thank you. <laughs> we will uh, actually be able to uh, automatically deploy uh, the application into my Minikube cluster. So if I check my cluster right now, there's nothing there. So I can build my application just like any other, just like any other um, Java application. So this is built, okay. And then I can actually build a container image using the KTS build goal we saw before push it into my Docker Hub registry. Generate the cluster resources. And finally, apply them. So we've now if we now check the cluster, we already have the application running, and I should be able to perform a request. Yeah, and as you can see, uh, it just went there. It's super easy to, to, to set up. We check what really happened under the covers is that Jcube actually created um, 
a Docker file for us. So you can, this is transparent for the user, but you can see that it did create a, a Docker file with multiple layers and, and some complexity. And it also created the Kubernetes YAML files. So all of this stuff gets really hidden from us, and it's uh, done automatically uh, for us. Yeah, so actually the, the point of this very short demo, I hope you, you've seen that you can start very quickly with any, with every, uh, without any knowledge of Kubernetes at all, but uh, the point is that you really can integrate it into your current existing workflow. You only have to mention or reference an existing plugin and you don't need to learn any new tooling. I think this is one of the key benefits of, uh, of using, using su such tooling in there. And, uh, and of course, you can still con continue to use test containers, other stuff for, for an inner loop part. But, uh, but yeah, so this was the point. This was one example. As I said, I hope that there will be more tooling which is coming, which are looking like, like this and uh, in, uh, improving the development experience because it's still hard. It's still hard to, to get your application, especially if you have a lot of external dependencies on the Kubernetes itself. Yeah, with that, I think uh, if there are any questions, actually, we have still some, some minutes for questions. There's one over here. So maybe you, I, I try to repeat that, so maybe. Yeah, so this one is only for Java at the moment, right? So this is, unfortunately, there's not, as I said, we haven't found anything similar in other languages, but for now it's only in Java, but maybe people, yeah find this useful and try this everywhere else. And actually, I have to say, there is also a history of the plugin. So if you have heard about the Fabricate Maven plugin previously, so this was one done several years ago by Reddit as well. This is the evolution of it. So it's really separated. So it's pure Kubernetes. So the original plugin was also a little bit OpenShift uh, focused. Um, but this one is really now a pure under neutral foundation there. So this is the, the next step. in. The Fabricant Maven plugin, if you know that. Yeah, so sorry. But actually, if you like, you can start on one. <laughs> I think the concepts are quite interesting because the, 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 the generation, there are pluggable generators that create all these YAML files for you. And of course, you can create your own generators for your developers so that they can, uh, that you have also can bring in your own opinions how you create YAML files. OK, I think now we are uh, over with the time. Or is there any last question? If not, then thank you very much for joining. I hope you enjoy the rest of the CubeCon. Thank you.